So joining me on the stage right now is Dr. Lewis Bartlett. He is an infectious disease biologist, entomologist, and evolutionary ecologist at the University of Georgia's Center for Ecology of Infectious Diseases. He uses field studies, laboratory experiments, and computer simulations to understand how changes in beekeeping are actually affecting bee diseases, both in the short and long term. So all the way from Georgia, please give a huge Texas welcome to Dr. Lewis Bartlett. All right, thank you, JJ, and thank you all for having me here. Uh, it's been great to travel over. It's um, being quite high up my list to be able to come down to Texas to speak to y'all. As JJ said, I'm obviously not from around here. I traveled in from Georgia, as my accent might give away. <laughs> but in reality, I first started beekeeping about 10 years ago in North England, where I grew up. Uh, that's also when I first started doing work on the infectious diseases of honeybees, the parasites that afflict them, and the research that needs to be done to help understand and prevent all the nasties out there that are trying to afflict or damage our, our precious honeybees. So it's a pleasure to be able to speak um, in multiple occasions at this conference on that. And this morning I'm going to be specifically speaking about the efforts to breed better bees, um, so-called Darwinian beekeeping or survivor stock or hygienic bees, all these topics that I'm going to cover. And speak a little bit from the perspective of an evolutionary biologist who has spent many, many years evolving many different insects to do lots of things, and some lessons in humility and some lessons in hope, to make sure that as we move forward as a community in trying to better define our bee stock, that we don't fall prey to uh, easy problems, and that we are all on the same page about what we're trying to achieve and how we can get there. So, for the structure of this talk, um, I'm going to cover four main things. I'm going to talk about the actual problem that I'll be focusing in on today. I'm not going to be talking about breeding for things like honey production or, um, or nukes or anything like that. That's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I'm going to specifically talk about pests and pathogens. That's parasites, things like varroa, viruses, all the other nasties. And then we're going to move on to looking to nature. So these adaptive solutions to the problem of honeybees not being able to defend themselves against some of the new threats that have arrived in the US and the rest of the world recently. Rather than trying to treat everything with um, harsh chemicals and pesticides, which I know is a divisive topic, there's a lot of effort to help the honeybees help themselves. So we're going to do an overview of that. We're then going to move specifically into the popularity of bee breeding that's been championed by Tom Seeley of late, although there's many scientists that have been pushing for this for the last couple of decades. And that's where we're going to dive into some core evolutionary theory. So uh, brace yourselves for when the science comes out. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of infectious disease biology and how it pertains to honeybees. And in particular, I'd like everyone when they leave this lecture today to have a good understanding of the difference between animals being resistant to and tolerant to different diseases. And this has become unfortunately easier as everyone's infectious disease knowledge has increased mysteriously over the last year and a half or two. Suddenly, um, my, the need to explain viruses uh, from the basics up has uh, decreased of late. And then we're going to talk finally about this kind of past um, and future of proofing and lessons that we can learn from previous efforts to breed better bees and where we all want to go in terms of moving forward, uh, evolving our bee stock. So let's start with the problem that I'm really addressing and that I was invited to speak on throughout this conference, and that's pests and pathogens, or parasites as I broadly call them. And there's a litany of different parasites that affect our honeybees, uh, from the large, like Varroa, to the very small, like these uh, Microsporidia, these are Nacema, now called Viremorpha, tiny little things that live in the gut of the bee, causing dysentery at the best, this is just bee diarrhea essentially, or death at the worst if they can um, evacuate themselves in a necessary time. There's all sorts of other weird and wonderful diseases of honeybees. This is a fungal disease. This is either chalk brood, ascophera, or stone brood caused by aspergillus. This was actually the very first honeybee parasite I worked on. It's not something I encounter frequently in Georgia or indeed when I was in California, beekeeping there. But if you go back to Britain, this was a really common problem in our colonies. Whole legions of honeybee hives covered in these fungal, mummified bee larvae. And that's just something that I like to highlight because no matter where you go in the world, there's going to be different challenges. What bees face in terms of challenges in one location is not the same as they face in another. Beekeeping in Texas is different to in Georgia. That's different to California, and it's very different to Britain. 
And a thread of thought that I would like everyone to try and maintain is that when we talk about breeding better bees, that has to be contextualized in the place that those bees are being kept, and it has to be contextualized for what the beekeeper wants from those bees as well. Just because one person in one location in some far-flung corner of the world has bees that do well there does not necessarily mean they will here. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, which to me is exciting and interesting, but can be a little bit frustrating, particularly with the modern internet and people looking for information from all over the globe, potentially, uh, neglecting to speak to beekeepers locally. We have bacterial diseases, which um, are a variable problem as well. Here we have European fowl brood, essentially a disease of starvation. Uh, it's almost like honeybee tapeworms, really. It consumes all the, all the food in the bees' gut, and then they starve to death. You see this just about everywhere on occasion. Here's a gruesome close-up of something that I'm called out to see all the time in Georgia. And then a much more serious one, um, this is American fowl brood. I hope and pray that no one who's a new beekeeper ever encounters this. Back home in Britain, if this is found inside a colony, you are legally obligated to burn the entire apiary. Uh, and there's jail time if you don't do this, so it's taken extremely seriously. But by virtue of that, it means I've never encountered it apart from within scientific research. There are some friendlier, Maybe diseases, this is a small hive beetle, an area of work that I have expanded into recently. This is about the only cute photo of a small hive beetle I can find. I find them quite charming with their club little antenna, um, and I usually get chased off the stage when I say that I find small hive beetles cute because most of them has don't encounter them looking teddy bear-like in this photo. We encounter them instead as this gruesome, slimy, awful mess. And this is a problem specifically in Georgia that many of our beekeepers cite as being their number one uh, parasite difficulty. A lot of our more experienced beekeepers, kind of three, four years in, they've got things like Varroa under control, but we're really struggling with small hive beetles in Georgia. And I expect they're quite a problem down here as well, just by virtue of the, uh, the climate. Tracheal mites are something that I'm going to talk about a little bit more in detail later on. Um, we don't encounter these as a too prevalent problem anymore. They're around, but they're not wiping out whole colonies typically. For anyone that doesn't know where tracheal mites live, um, here's an example of a Hercules beetle larva. And it has almost these submarine-like ports on the side of it. Y'all can see those. These little holes with uh, branching white structures. And this is how insects breathe. They essentially have tiny little portholes all down the lateral sides of their body. And then from there, we have branching tubes that allows gas exchange. They don't have lungs as we do. They don't breathe as we do. Instead, they have these, uh, these little portholes that gases move through. And tracheal mites live within these. They crawl into the, the lungs of the bee, essentially, and then they suck their blood through that. And when enough of them begin doing that, the bee drowns in its own blood, which is upsetting. This is a problem that we fixed a while ago, and there are lessons to be learned from that that I will uh, go into detail a little bit later. Finally, the one we're probably all most familiar with, uh, the Varroa mite. They spilled over from different honeybee species in Southeast Asia. Here's a map showing the seven different honeybee species concentrated in Southeast Asia. The Varroa mite spilled over from the one in teal here, Apis serrana, the other domesticated honeybee, and has since spread just about worldwide. With a couple of exceptions, Australia is still a major landmass without Varroa, um, as well as, I believe that's New Newfoundland. Uh, don't know how the Canadians are managing that, but for now, they've still got this tiny little bastion of Varroa-free beekeeping, which I've never experienced um, beekeeping pre-Varroa, but I am told it was a much better time in terms of being able to enjoy it. So hopefully, we'll get a better handle on this, which is the focus of today's talk, making sure that bees are able to keep Varroa mites off their backs like this to help prevent the outcome, which is the vectoring of viruses. Varroa vector viruses in the same way that mosquitoes vector things like malaria, or ticks vector things like Lyme disease. And I'll give an entire talk on this in one of the breakout sessions for those of you who are of slightly more masochistic intent and wish uh, to suffer another hour of me speaking in detail about how this interaction between Varroa and viruses works. Look out for that um, later today if you're interested. They also vector things like sac root viruses, and all of this together has led to a, a decline and then suppression of the US honeybee stock. And this is really why the USDA, for example, funds so much of our research, because there is unmet pollination demand within US agriculture. Beekeepers are struggling to sustain their honeybee colonies and grow their apiaries large enough to meet current population demand. And a lot of this is due to the arrival of Varroa and other coincidental pests and parasites that has been tasked to scientists like me to help solve, which I do gladly. Now, it's always a bit of a 
mixed um, request to come in and speak exclusively about pests and parasites because all of that's really quite depressing. No one wants to get into beekeeping to hear about the hundreds of different ways in which the world is out to kill your bees. But as people, we're quite inventive in coming up with new solutions, which is going to be the focus of part of today's talk. Um, and one of my favorites of these comes from my homeland in Britain, where in order to sniff out diseases of honeybees, we've recruited very particular beekeeping colleagues. Here we have a beekeeper um, in his beekeeping suit who has been trained to sniff out different bacterial and other infectious diseases of honeybees. He works very hard and is all around a pretty good boy. So hopefully that improves the mood a little bit. I always like to take a break after detailing all the things that are killing our bees to just say, you know, there's, there's promise out there. We're very good at coming up with new solutions and sometimes those solutions are, are particularly satisfying to look at. Okay, so in terms of coming up with more realistic solutions other than just training many chocolate Labradors to help sniff out problem bees, one of the current emphases in beekeeping is looking to the ways bees already defend themselves to help bolster those efforts, to help breed bees that are more able to defend themselves against these parasites. And really that's all about looking to nature and adaptive solutions. So there's certain ways in which bees are able to better equip themselves to protect from infectious disease and from parasites. Broadly, I group these into nutrition. Some bees are just more uh, nutritionally able to recruit the amount of protein and carbohydrates and foodstuff essentially to fuel the expensive costly mechanisms that underpin their immunity. We'll get into that. There's a lot of self-medication work going on, in particular Malus Bivax work, who I was up speaking to just a few weeks ago, looking at all the botanical products that honeybees use to help treat their diseases that aren't necessarily for forage. I know um, there's been a lot of interest in fungal extracts in this regard. Feel free to come talk to me about that, but it's not my work, so it's not my place to present it. I'm not the expert on that. And really today, I'm gonna to focus more on the, the overarching one of behavior, all the different behavioral elements that honeybees exhibit that allow them to better protect themselves against things like varroa. Just some examples of these, we have things like propolis, we have hygienic bees, which for a long time always appeared slightly more aggressive. We have some good genetic evidence for that, but good bee breeding programs are able to tease those apart. In the wild, we know that the, F, the action of swarming really reduces the amount of varroa and other parasites that are in the colony. And so there's different elements of beekeeping and bee behavior that we know help the bees protect themselves from these diseases. But none of these are particularly good things. Highly propolized hives are extremely difficult to work, especially in colder climates. Hygienic or aggressive bees are not necessarily everyone's cup of tea. Uh, Francis Ratniex, who I'll be talking about a bit later, was uh, one of my early mentors in beekeeping, and he famously will keep very angry bees without a veil, take 40 to 50 stings around his eyes without flinching. And the first time I saw that, I thought, this is not a good man to judge what a good bee is. He's a good guy, don't get me wrong, but when he says, oh, this is a fantastic colony and he's had 50 stings to his face within 10 minutes, I don't think we're quite on the same page as to what makes a good beekeeping colony. And similarly, swarming is something that, yes, it might help the bees protect themselves against parasites, against infectious disease, and make them overall healthier, but we spend a lot of time trying to get our bees not to do this in the effort to uh, help them make honey and, and hoard as much foodstuff as possible. So, this really starts coming down to the core idea that we have in adaptive evolutionary biology of trade-offs. You can't have everything and nothing comes for free. There's a price to be paid for every aspect of our honeybees biology. And if we want them to be good at one thing, we have to make concessions in what other things they're going to be less good at. And this is why when we talk about breeding better bees, we will never find a universally excellent bee. Different bee breeds will be better at certain things and better suited for specific activities, for specific climates, and every effort that we make to help them defend themselves, for example, against pests and pathogens are gonna come at a cost. So breeding for specific traits is not at all unusual. We've been doing this in animals and in plants especially for a long time, especially breeding them to be resistant to certain diseases. So there's contemporary examples of this as well as historic ones. And as I mentioned, underpinning all of this as a biologist is this idea of um, trade-offs and costs. So being resistant to anything is costly, whether that's maintaining an immune system or whether it's altering your behavior that makes foraging less efficient in order to help protect yourself from infectious diseases. 
We say these are theoretically necessary. If resistance wasn't costly, then all our bees would already be resistant to everything. There has to be something that makes developing resistance difficult, but that's quite a challenging evolutionary question to answer. So I'm gonna deviate a little bit from speaking about bees and instead um, detail some work that I did throughout my graduate research um, at UC Berkeley principally, where rather than working on the evolution of disease resistance in bees, instead I looked at a laboratory model so that we can more easily learn some lessons and uh, then apply them to honeybee work. So that's really a core of my research is generalizations about ecology and evolutionary biology and then making sure that we apply those well-known lessons to honeybees. So we're not gonna talk about bees for a little bit, we're gonna talk about this. This is Plodia interpunctella, the Indian meal moth. Um, hands up if you've ever had moths like in your pantry, in your flower or in your bran or something. Yeah, that was this little blighter. So I spent five years accidentally bringing these home from the lab, from the lab with me. Back then I had hair, RIP, um, and they'd hide in my curls and they'd come back to my kitchen and they'd infest my kitchen. So if anyone ever actually needs lessons in how to get rid of these, I honestly also consider myself the world expert in getting rid of these damn moths. But because they thrive so easily in stored products in things like oatmeal or flour or bran, we can keep them in the laboratory exceedingly easily. It's difficult not to keep them in the laboratory. So they're a great lab system, unlike honeybees, which we can't raise in controlled environments. Honeybees can only be raised out in the wild, which is Great, it's where they belong, but for doing controlled science on them, that makes certain things a bit of a challenge. So we have to look to these other model systems to learn some lessons that we can then apply to, bre to bee breeding. Unfortunately, Plodia are really quite drab. They're totally lacking in charisma, and they're also a literal pest. They are a pest species. So rather than um, show images of the actual Plodia larva, I'm gonna replace them with um, this cartoon caterpillar from the popular franchise Pokemon. This is Caterpie. Feel free to say hello. So meet Plodia, a small moth larva. Normally, Plodia larva grow up very quickly to pupate and metamorphose into their adult form, and there's a lot of selection pressure to make sure that they do that as quickly as possible. They want to be able to reach their adult stage so that they can breed as fast as possible. So they grow up broadly quite quickly. However, they're very vulnerable to a specific virus, Plodia interpunctella granulosis virus. Much as our bees suffered from many, many different viruses, deformed wing being the one of most focus currently. All other insects also suffer from viral infections and they all combat them in roughly the same way. So by looking at the ways in which this virus kills Plodia, we can make some generalizations about how insects cope with viral infections generally. This virus always kills its host. If it gets into the caterpillar, the caterpillar dies, very sad. So the caterpillars are able to adapt in some way to resist this virus, but it's been repeatedly shown that as the caterpillars change themselves to resist this virus, they grow much more slowly, which is not great for them. It's a cost to resistance, and so part of my early research that I've now began applying to honeybees in terms of their bee breeding was to demonstrate that some of these costs are unavoidable. And here's a couple of fancy quotations from my much cleverer colleagues that basically laid down the gauntlet to show that scientifically, these costs can't be avoided. There's no way of evolving your way around paying some kind of price to be resistant to viruses and infectious diseases. So I was challenged with showing that this is what we call constitutive and genetic. And the genetic means that there's no way to avoid it. And the constitutive means that you are paying the price of potentially being resistant even if you don't encounter the virus. And that again comes down to that context that I was talking about earlier. Bees that are very good at defending themselves against something like chalk brood are paying a price for being able to defend themselves against it. And if they find themselves in an area where they're not encountering chalk brood, then there's no point paying that price. And that context dependence really defines a lot of my views in where we need to go in certain regions in breeding for particular traits. So, I showed this by demonstrating that this cost is unavoidable by basically forcing them to inbreed. Um, lots of exciting research that looks like this. I'm not gonna go into the details because I'm quite glad this chapter of my life is behind me. Um, and I published that fairly recently where essentially what we showed was that as you reduce the susceptibility, that is increase the resistance, 
of these larvae, they take significantly longer to grow. About 50% more of their lifespan is spent growing when you, when you evolve them to be the most resistant they can be to these viruses. And this should, broadly, translate to basically anything else in evolutionary biology. When we're breeding our bees to be resistant to something, whether that's varroa or viruses, they are paying some unavoidable costs. Now, it might not be as simply demonstrated as it is in Plodia, where we just show that it takes them seven more days longer to grow because they're so energetically inefficient, because they're investing in their immune systems, they're reducing their food intake to make sure that they're not consuming too much virus. But this will generalize to bees, and I could very confidently apply this graph to bees as well and say that the bees most able to defend themselves against varroa and viruses are going to be the worst at something else. So, plodia that are vulnerable are competitive in that they grow quickly, and plodia that aren't vulnerable are disadvantaged by growing more slowly. So we also then asked following this, and this is a section that's kind of a lesson in humility for me, so bear with me. We said, well, if we know that the plodia can be selected to be resistant, but that that comes at the cost of growing much more slowly, can we, can we use that bit of information to say, well, say we want a bunch of resistant moths, but we don't want to be continually infecting them with virus. Can we just take the moths that grow more slowly and then get resistant moths at the end of it? And hopefully that analogy is useful in terms of things like bee breeding, where when we are breeding for bees that are, for instance, more resistant to varroa, we're not necessarily always throwing varroa at them and then watching them attack those varroa. Often we're hands off or just selecting for the strongest colonies, for example, which we mentally link to being resistant to varroa. But we thought we'd try that out in this moth again, and this was work published fairly recently, now represented by my colleague's fascination with a very hungry caterpillar instead of, uh, instead of caterpie. So for five years, Five years of my life, I um, bred these moths to be either fast or slow growing. It's very interesting. And when we looked at them at the end of that, we were hoping to find that the slowest growing moths would be the most resistant. And what that would allow us to do is apply general principles in how to better breed insects to be resistant to viruses, not by necessarily constantly infecting them, but by looking for correlates that would allow us a more easy time assaying them and deciding who we wanted to keep. And we found exactly the opposite. We found that our slow growing moths were actually more vulnerable to the virus. So I spent five years of my life trying to breed slow growing virus resistant moths and got the opposite. And when we compared them to those uh, moths I evolved earlier, what we actually managed to do was just breed moths that were really bad at being moths. That's, that's all we managed. We, we selected for these slow-growing moths, hoping that would make them you know, really strong in the face of viruses, but they were actually just mutated, genetically defunct, poorly performing, universally garbage moths. And so this is something of a lesson in humility to me, someone with apparently a doctorate in infectious diseases and the evolution of insects, is that these things are never as simple as we like to make out. And as we move forward, selecting things in our bees, we are going to encounter surprises where what we assumed was gonna be a simple story of how to get from one place to another ends up taking us on a journey where we may well waste uh, time and resources. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So what happened when I selected for growth rate? Does it um, inadvertently select for better resistant moths as we might apply to something like honeybees? No, it does not. So a word of caution when taking on these breeding programs, it is easy to end up with something you didn't plan because evolution is not necessarily well guided. So enough with Plodia, back to the star of the show, the honeybee. And let's talk about these lessons that I've just gone into detail on the evolution of resistance in insects and how we apply them specifically to bee breeding and this Darwinian approach to trying to select bees and not make bad bees, but make better bees. Maybe I'm not the right person given that I uh, can't do this even in moths, but I'd like to highlight in particular the efforts of Tom Seeley to really champion this approach, and he has some exceptional ideas in this book. And I'm gonna go into detail about how Tom's approach and how other scientists' approaches are the same in some regards, different in others, and how the outcomes might be different based on the nuances of how we go about breeding our bees. And this isn't a new idea, right? People have been looking for genes or signatures of resistance to varroa in particular for a long time, looking at things like hygienic behavior or other methods by which the bees police these varroa inside the colonies. 
And so I've just pulled out a couple of examples. This is by no means exhaustive, and there's many of my colleagues who have done a lot of work on this. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Francis Ratniak's work and his hygienic screening. He's the professor um, back in Britain who originally first taught me, the one who takes kind of 50 stings to the face and doesn't even bat an eyelash. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, hygienic behaviors in general and shout out to Brock Harper's work at Purdue on the mite biters, that's a very promising one. I know there's great efforts here in Texas to come up with varroa resistant bees. I was speaking with Miles Spivak on this recently, and I think we're really starting to get a handle on this, but there are still pitfalls to be wary of. So, hygienic behavior is essentially where uh, the colony performs an immune-like function, where an infected cell, or honeybee, is killed and chopped up by her sisters because she's dangerous, she's full of parasites. Here we can see that where a larva with an obvious varroa infection has been ripped out, they're going to chop her up and dismember her body and get rid of her because she is a sunk cost, she's got too many varroa, and it's very easy to screen for this. So this is a mechanism by which honeybees are resistant to varroa that we can very easily measure. We're not having to select on something that correlates like I tried to do with the moths, we can often measure their ability to do this really precisely. And we do this by freezing um, a known circle of brood here with liquid nitrogen, and then we leave them for 24 to 48 hours, and we see how many of those frozen dead brood they've removed. And this would be a very hygienic colony where they've removed all that dead brood nearly instantly. And so we can just select for queens that show this behavior and come up with really, really hygienic bees. And we've been doing this for a long time. Here we have a paper from 2007, I believe, yep. Um, where they have been implementing field trials of these hygienic varroa-resistant colonies for a while. So if we've been doing this since 2007, why haven't we fixed this problem yet? It's a promising line of reasoning, but if we've been going at it for 15 years, why don't we have the full solution yet? And that's again because evolving resistance comes at a cost. And I mentioned that hygienic bees are often aggressive, and conceptually, I think this makes sense. This is quite an aggressive behavior. Here you have a bunch of sisters going into one of their unborn bee sisters, tearing her out, dismembering her body, and then dumping it out the front of the house. That is an inherently aggressive behavior. So it makes sense that when we're selecting on this, that we're also making them just meaner and angrier. And it's quite difficult to avoid those genetic linkages, to avoid the genes that underpin both this and aggressive-like behaviors. And indeed, when we looked at um, some of the European work that was done breeding hygienic bees by Francis and some of his colleagues, and then we looked at their genetics, we'd spent about three million euros in European research funding re-evolving bees that genetically look like Africanized honeybees. So we'd spent millions of pounds in scientific money, not me personally, this is one where I just get to detail a, a lesson in humility from my colleagues, essentially re-evolving angry Africanized bees. And that was not necessary, really. Uh, we could have just gone and got some you know, from Africa or from here. We didn't need to spend all this time and effort trying to evolve hygienic bees that actually, on a genetic level, just looked like aggressive Africanized honeybees. And so this is, again, that lesson in trying to guide evolution it can be very challenging, and we have to be really careful about the outcomes that we find acceptable. Francis doesn't care that these bees are angry. He'll take 50 stings to the face, shrug it off, and to him, that's the joy of beekeeping. I am not doing that. Like, no, it's not happening, and I suspect most people in this room would not be happy if their bees were that angry or that hot. Some of our beekeepers in Georgia love hot bees. They find it a challenge. I'm not, I'm not one of them. I, I don't need that that difficulty in my life. So when we're talking about the outcomes of these different procedures and selecting on things like this, we need to be mindful of what costs we're paying and who those costs are acceptable to. Um, we'll see if things like the Purdue mite biters are aggressive. I don't think they are from my experience with them, um, but I'm hopefully gonna do work with people like Brock Harper to try and measure what costs those bees are paying in being good at policing varroa through these other mechanisms, because there will be some costs, and I think it's responsible as bee breeders and as scientists to be upfront with our beekeepers about what those bees are bad at as well as good at. It's all well and good saying this race of bees is exceptional at being resistant to varroa, but there must be something they're bad at, and knowing what that is is important to me in being upfront. Now, this isn't exactly the approach that Tom Seeley has popularized. Um, instead, he looks rather than at a mechanism of 
killing Varroa, he just looks at how many Varroa are in the colony, and he picks a threshold, and if a bee colony ever goes above that threshold, he kills it. So this is a kind of active culling technique of selecting for bees that are able to keep their Varroa population very, very low. And there's multiple mechanisms that could come out of this. Because Tom's way of uh, culling colonies that reach above a high Varroa threshold doesn't look at any particular way in which the bees do it, it's kind of blind to how the bees keep Varroa low. There's all sorts of ways in which uh, this could come out, including queens that are just extremely promiscuous. So we've done some work at UGA that should be published recently. Again, um, correlating, this is a slightly more complicated scientific graph than I'd like, but essentially what this shows is that the more drones of a queen has mated with, here we go from one to two to four to eight to 16 to 32, the fewer Varroa she has in a colony and the slower that Varroa population grows. And this is work by Catherine Hagen who just finished her master's degree uh, at the UGA Honeybee Lab. And so this is an example outcome of something that Tom's approach could incidentally select for. If you're just selecting for low Varroa number, you might end up just selecting for queens that are very, very promiscuous or very successful in mating with many drones during their nuptial flight. That's something we could probably select on ourselves if we wanted to, but we can't guarantee this would be the outcome, it's just one of many. And so if we have many, many different beekeepers all following this Varroa screen and culling approach, we'll probably end up with lots of different mechanisms evolving by which the bees do this. Some people will end up with really promiscuous bees, some people might end up with hygienic bees, others might end up with bees that, I don't know, some other inventive mechanism by which they're able to control Varroa, but we're kind of blind to the mechanism here, which isn't inherently a bad thing. The only worry I have with too many people pursuing a very active bee breeding regime uh, comes back to this. These are European black bees, or sometimes called German black bees, or Irish black bees, or Danish black bees. It really depends what country in Europe you're in, but pick a country in Northwestern Europe, and they're gonna be that country's black bee. Anyway, this is Apis mellifera mellifera, the purebred northern kind of European black bee. And again, in Europe, they've spent millions in funding trying to rebreed pure strains of this. There's an idea that their black tight hair makes Varroa much harder to attach, and so they're just more resistant to this mite because they basically have this like bare fur chest that protects them, like hairy armor, which is cool. Now, the reason we don't have purebred Mellifera mellifera is because of the tracheal mites I detailed earlier. These were one of our most northerly bee subraces. In order to be able to fly in the coldest temperatures that you find in parts of northwestern Europe where they evolved, they had a much more expansive and much bigger breathing system so that they could um, warm themselves up and then fly in much colder temperatures. So they were really good at flying in the cold, essentially. That's metabolically expensive. It requires a lot of oxygen in order to fuel very active flight in cold weather, so they had much more expansive, much bigger breathing tubes. That made them much, much more vulnerable to this. And in the late 1800s, when our Apis mellifera mellifera stocks were devastated by what then was called Isle of Wight disease, what we now know are tracheal mites, we spent a lot of time breeding resistance to this invasive parasitic mite that now, 100 years later, we're regretful we did because there are genetics that we lost in that purebred mellifera mellifera that we now want to recover to help resistance to Varroa. And so while we put in all this effort to combating Varroa, I don't want us to hamstring ourselves because in another 50 years, there will be a new challenge for our honeybees. And we do not want to accidentally lose genetics that we have now that are important for our future honeybee survival in the name of pursuing just one goal, for instance, of reducing Varroa parasitism rates. We do not want to make the same mistake that we did a couple of hundred years ago, where we're now trying to undo our efforts to breed resistance to an invasive parasitic mite. The final mechanism we might go about pursuing in terms of breeding better bees is the so-called survivor stock option. And I would like to highlight that this is very different to other mechanisms of achieving what seems like it might be the same goal. So the difference between Seeley's approach and survivor stock might seem subtle, but Seeley actively culling colonies above a certain Varroa level is different to just hands off leaving the strongest to survive. And I'm gonna go into some detail explaining why, because I think there's a degree of ecological responsibility that I'd like us all to consider 
decide if we think it's important, and then make sure we're all moving forward in a suitable fashion in trying to pursue so-called better bees. So we know that evolving resistance comes at a cost. I've labored that point a bunch, but it is something that I'd like everyone to understand. It's also quite evolutionarily complicated. Being resistant to a virus basically throws down the gauntlet to ask that virus to overcome your defenses. In evolutionary biology, we call this red queen evolution from uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, where the queen said to Alice, you can run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. This is what we call an evolutionary arms race, where a lot of life on Earth is constantly adapting to try and defend itself from its diseases and parasites that afflict it. Those diseases then immediately evolve in response and it's just this constant race to try and one up one another without ever actually getting to an end point where you are fully immune to the diseases that are trying to infect you. This is why we have to get, for instance, a new flu vaccine every year, because every time we make the population resistant to one flu strain, it throws down the challenge for flu to evolve to get around that immunity. And this happens in our bees as well. This makes resistance really difficult to achieve in the long term, because as soon as we breed, for instance, virus-resistant bees or varroa-resistant bees, those parasites are going to do their utmost to evolve a way around whatever defense we've bred into our bees. An alternative is what we call tolerance, and this is a subtle distinction that comes from my background of evolution of infectious disease biology that we know about quite well that I think is gonna be critically important in defining where we move in terms of Darwinian beekeeping and breeding better bees. Tolerance is a case where the pathogen has no or very little pressure to overcome it, because the host, the animal that the parasite's living on, has somehow come up with a way for the parasite to live there without causing much harm. And there's an illustrative example of this. I'm gonna to appeal to um, this very handsome lizard that was sent to me by a colleague, Erin McGee, if any of you are on Twitter, she's a fantastic herpetologist. She sent me this example, and uh, we can see that this lizard, which Erin's uh, masterfully lassoed here, uh, she's able to lasso a lizard from about 10 feet away, which I am constantly amazed by, but um, some of my colleagues are very talented. You might think that this lizard, who's a boy in this case, has this very handsome red spot. Perhaps it's to try and attract a girlfriend. Perhaps he's trying to advertise how virile he is by having this, this handsome, flashy red spot. You'd be very wrong. What this is called is actually a mite pocket, and that is bright red because it's full of chiggers. And this is an evolutionary tolerance adaptation where when chiggers attach to the lizard's eyes or its mouth or its nostrils, that can cause infection, it can cause blindness, it makes feeding much more difficult, and therefore the parasitism by the chiggers is costly for the lizard, it doesn't want them. Now, it could try and evolve grooming behaviors to get rid of them, and then the chiggers are just gonna evolve some better attachment mechanism. Instead, what we have here is something that's evolutionarily stable, where the lizard has just evolved this little pocket that all the chiggers can very happily live in. It's out of the way, that's packed full of immune cells to make sure it doesn't ca catch any further diseases from them. And the two animals now live in something of a, of a symbiosis that is chill for everyone. The lizard isn't being killed by the chiggers. There might be a tiny annoyance, but they're not attaching to its eyes. They're not attaching to its mouth. And the chiggers can live very happily. They are under no evolutionary pressure here to overcome. They've got a, they've got a cushy little home behind this lizard's ear. So why would they change? And this is a perfect example of how tolerance evolves in nature. This lizard is tolerant to chiggers. The chiggers are happy. And so it's a much more simple outcome. And we do see this happen with Varroa on occasion. So for instance, there's a Brazilian island where they have extremely high Varroa levels. In this case, it's because the Varroa here don't vector any deformed wing virus. The Varroa themselves are just munching on the bees and they're not transmitting any of these deadly viruses. And so the bees are able to tolerate the Varroa even at very high levels quite well. So again, no one's evolving in this circumstance. There's no virus, so the bees are able to cope with Varroa very well. And this really illustrates the example that if the, if the bees are able to somehow tolerate or get rid of the viruses, the Varroa no longer become a problem. And if you want to hear more about that, come to my talk this afternoon. More recent work in Sweden, this is the island of Gotland, identified that bees which had been left to undertake this survivor stock approach to combating Varroa aren't resistant to Varroa or their viruses. What they are is just tolerant to the viruses. And this was shown by taking these bees which had been left to evolve to their own devices, so-called survivor stocking, 
from a good many generations, taking them into the lab, and some of my colleagues challenged them with viral inocula. They purposely infected them with high doses of viruses. And the Gotland bees, the kind of survivor stock bees, are in the dark gray, and normal bees are in the light gray. And we can see that the Gotland bees survive at much higher rates when challenged with a very potent dose of these viruses that Varroa vector. They're surviving at much higher rates, but when we look at how much virus is in them, particularly the deformed wing virus in the blue here, the light blue are the normal bees, the dark blue are the Gotland bees, we see no differences. So even though the Gotland bees are surviving at much higher rates, they are just as infected with these viruses as their counterparts. And again, this is a classic example of tolerance. These bees aren't resisting the virus, they're surviving by virtue of a tolerance mechanism, but they're still chock full of virus. So this is an example of tolerance evolving as we might predict because it's easier to evolve than resistance when we just let the bees do their own thing. Now that might feel like a great solution to the problem of varroa and viruses. If we can evolve a bunch of tolerant bee stock that are chock full of virus and chock full of varroa but they don't suffer any penalty for it, then it feels like our job's done. But our honeybees exist in an environment more than just the apiary that we put them in. And there are other bees that exist in that environment with them, like this handsome, carpen like this handsome bumblebee, carpenter bee, leaf cutter bee, which I particularly think is quite cute. Another reason tolerance evolves is that we, want it, we call it spitefully competitively adaptive. And by that I mean, if resistance comes at a cost, or tolerance comes at a cost, there are always going to be cheaters who want to evade that cost of resistance. Now, if an entire population is just about all resistant to a disease, there's really none of that disease going around. And so someone who doesn't do their part to become resistant can cheat. They can hide within the herd, and herd immunity will protect them. And by virtue of that, they're able to evolutionarily cheat the system by not paying the cost of doing their part of being resistant to that disease. In a tolerant population, if most of the individuals are tolerant, they're chock full of virus, they're full of infectious agents, and if a vulnerable individual walks into that population, they're gonna get snuffed out because they're surrounded by infectious individuals. So by virtue of this, tolerance is easier to maintain evolutionarily because it also protects the population from cheaters. Unfortunately, diseases don't stay in our honeybees. This is work by Pete Greystock from 2015, who I actually first trained with back in 2012 when he was um, at University of Leeds. He was one of the first people to show that honeybee diseases move from honeybees into wild bees. In his case, working on Nasema, uh, moving into bumblebees, and it has been since shown with a variety of viruses. In particular, deformed wing virus, we have good genetic evidence that it moves from honeybees into bumblebees and back. This is work from Lena Wilfert, one of my former advisors. And we have increasingly large bodies of evidence showing that all the infectious diseases, especially the viruses in our honeybees, are dangerous to the other wild bees that they live alongside. Some of the best demonstration of this was done in the Channel Islands um, and islands around the UK and France by one of my former colleagues, Dr. Robin Manley. And she compared islands where Varroa still hadn't arrived to islands where Varroa were present. And rather than looking at the viruses in the honeybees, looked at viruses in bumblebees and showed that when varroa are in honeybees, even though varroa don't parasitize bumblebees, varroa and bumblebees never interact. When varroa are in honeybees, bumblebees have much more severe viral infections because they're catching deformed wing virus from these heavily infected honeybees. So this in our honeybees matters for this in our environment. And we can generalize this across a whole range of honeybee diseases. And so as we move forward to try and help our bees defend themselves against this litany of infectious diseases. Even though a colony might be very thriving, what we don't want is this to be a tolerant colony full of disease that becomes a biohazard for the rest of the environment that we place our bees in. And if we're interested in keeping sites like this in nature, we have to be careful that how we evolve our bees to be either resistant or tolerant to infectious diseases is the outcome we want. Now, people like Tom Seeley, who champion culling hives above a certain varroa level don't end up with tolerant bees. That, that mechanism of evolution cannot select for tolerance. It can only select for resistance. Efforts like the hygienic bees can only be resistant. The danger comes in if we take a hands-off approach, an unguided approach, and let nature run its course 
Nature is vicious and nature is cruel. And if we take a survivor stock approach, we need to understand that the most likely outcome is that we will breed bees that are dangerous for our other fluffy butted friends. And I'm happy to discuss that in more detail with anyone. I am not telling anyone what they do or do not need to care about, but my job is to make sure that every beekeeper here has the biological knowledge to make an informed decision about how they want their bees to behave, both for their own beekeeping and in their environment. And with that, it has been a pleasure to open this conference, and I'm happy to take some questions before we move to break. Thank you all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the question was um, the different ways in which queens could be more or less promiscuous. And that's, that's a, a, a term we use in science that I think carries a slightly different meaning when moved here. Uh, I, I try and be careful not to say anything too out of line. But yeah, there's a whole range of different mechanisms that could underpin certain queens being mated with more drones. They might be better flyers. Um, drones do a really interesting thing where in order to prevent a queen from mating more. We all know that they, they leave their genitals in and they explode and there's all that kind of firework effect, right? But what they also do is they fill their semen with a small um, RNA molecule that interferes with the queen's vision to blind her. So it's within the interest of the drones to try and bias their own sperm to be more represented. So they fill it with a chemical that blinds the queen to prevent her going on more nuptial, uh, extending her nuptial flight. So a great mechanism would be queens that are more resistant to that drone blinding mechanism would be able to mate with more because the more male, males they mate with, the stronger their colony is within their interest. And yeah, they might just be bigger, they might be better flyers, they might have better pheromones, but we now have this new mechanism where the drones are limiting queen mating by causing her to go temporarily blind, um, and they might be more resistant to that. So there's a whole range of mechanisms that could underpin that, you're entirely right. Yep. Yeah, so the question was, if we know that packing a queen full of lots and lots of drones worth of sperm makes for a much stronger colony, why aren't we just artificially doing that? And having done a lot of queen artificial inseminations and watched the colonies, we're just very bad at it. It's a very delicate task. The sperm die very easily as soon as you try removing them from the drones. And broadly, AI queens are difficult to, make, to, to do well. Um, even some of the best people in the business, so Crispin, for instance, who's up at Purdue, comes down to our lab to help us out with it because even after 10 years of doing work like that, it's still really challenging. I think if we can come up with a better AI mechanism for queens, then that could be a great solution. But for now, is there's a technological limit on our ability to artificially inseminate queens. It's really difficult to do well, and those colonies usually don't last particularly long. If anything, it makes doing the science really hard, because we often write these big grants saying, oh, we're gonna artificially inseminate all these queens to study this, this, and this. And then the colonies, uh, they need nursing so heavily to keep alive. So I, I agree on the idea. We're not there yet in terms of a very practical ability to artificially inseminate them. So the question was whether or not we've um, annotated, as we call it, the full honeybee genome so that we know what each gene's doing, and then we can look for whether or not there are specific genes that we can just see if they're present, and that should relate to, to certain phenotypes, as we call them, in particular, mite resistance. And there is work doing that. The difficulty is that a lot of the genes in honeybees control multiple things. So it kind of comes back to that aggression example I was talking about where we know there are gene variants that lead to better varroa control, but they are also genes that we understand to be involved in, involved in things like guarding behavior and other aggressive-like um, qualities. The other side of it is that the, our understanding of insect immunity generally is still quite poor, so we're not very good even when we fully sequence insect genomes at labeling things as immune genes very well because the way in which invertebrate immunity works is so different to mammals and vertebrates that we're still figuring out exactly how some of it works and what those genes should look like. Um, their antiviral immune system is extremely different from ours. They don't have white blood cells and things like that. Instead, they rely on these small um, short, short chain or strand DNA that directly interferes with the virus. But finding that in the honeybee genome can be quite difficult. So there's a lot of good work being done on that um, by population geneticists, which I am not. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of promise in being able to screen for those particular genes. Yes. <laughs> 
Yes, yeah. So the, the question was whether or not there is, um, whether it's easy for the honeybees to lose those defense mechanisms, and that's absolutely right. If they're not being exposed to certain viruses, they will almost certainly quickly lose the ability to be immune to that, um, just because they're very delicate genetic mechanisms, and they're typically quite costly. And in the case of viruses, they're sequence specific. So if a mutation crops up that ruins it, and those bees aren't instantly killed because the virus is out there um, to get them, if they're shielded from it, then yeah, it will disappear quite quickly without us necessarily knowing.